So we also participated, I mean, oncology institution in the program of extended access, early access. We had many patients who were screened, almost 1,500 and 100 patients got treatment. Of course, uh, our experience is limited, but currently two more patients are getting treatment. Sorry, screened 144 and treated 100, not uh, 1,500, sorry. And uh, we will demonstrate our results now. So this slide confirms that we had different patients, you know, starting from age 19 up to age 78. Mainly patients were pre-treated and uh, not to, to be misled, uh, that uh, first line that was adjuvant treatment definitely and uh, ipilimumab uh, we considered to be as first drug line which did not contradict inclusion criteria. Speaking about the uh, prevalence of process, we had many patients who had already uh, brain lesions, one-fifth of patients. Also, we can say that almost 20, 17 percent of patients had uh, bone lesions. Uh, so, yeah, so the prevalence of the process was pretty large and patients uh, were really severe. Speaking about, this, about staging, so mainly that was stage uh, 4 M1C. And in the third stage, it was just, you know, several patients, about 4%. So patients received uh, 333 cycles uh, from one to four cycles, and an average three cycles each, and five patients got reinduction. The efficacy, and uh, uh, Professor Mesienko, uh, already mentioned that uh, Professor Dimitrov already mentioned that. So we did not expect that uh, we reach complete response in many in many patients. That was just three percent stabilization of process and partial regression, uh, which is uh, really significant for immune therapeutic agents. Reached thirty one percent stabilization and partial regression. So, and uh, if we compare our data with the results of pivotal reg registration studies, so you can see here that in figures we have the same. What is interesting in uh, practical sense, we are dealing with totally different molecules, and this is not chemotherapy. So these are immune oncological molecules. They are not focused directly against the tumor. They are focused on um, influencing immunity and then organism itself start working against tuna. Uh, immunomonoclonal antibodies can circulate for pretty long time in the organism. The circulating time is pretty long, and this is how they provide efficacy and expected toxicity. As you may see here in the slide, you can see the results of CT, lung CT in our female patients. So this is March 2013, before the start of treatment. So uh, there was no metastasis in lungs, and after the finalization, one month after the EP, we identified particular lesions, and our X-ray team considered them to be metastatic. But nevertheless, without any clinical manifestation, we did not add any treatment, and we continued to follow up this patient. So this is how this follow-up uh, led to the fact that in the controlling uh, examination, we didn't see any changes. And until now, patient is OK. And uh, the last picture is October 2015. You can see them on the right. So once again, it confirms that if you have no clinical picture, clinical manifestation of progression using such drugs like ipilimumab, uh, you should not think about the progression of the disease. Uh, it can be pseudo progression, and you still should follow these patients. So this slide, we wanted to demonstrate you uh, long-term partial regression. You see these changes in the liver before the treatment. So we have very large uh, lesion in the liver, and four cycles regression, and uh, and then three and a half years later, after the start of treatment, you cannot identify them at all. So the patient feels satisfactory, no complaints, and uh, visits us uh, regularly for controlling examinations. Speaking about patient survival. Median of follow-up was pretty long. It was uh, almost one year, in fact, 328 days. And uh, time to progression median, according to our data, was 105 days. So that means three months, three, three and a half months, in fact. And median of overall survival reach, reached uh, 
406 days, which is more than one year, 13 months, in fact. As you can see here, we calculated in detail the percentage of patients that are still uh, only follow up without the features of progression. So we continue our follow up. And we do believe that this data would be updated soon. We spoke a lot yesterday and today that there is particular prognostic factors in the patients with metastatic melanoma. And one of such factors is LDH level, like that the hydrogen is. So this slide very illustratively demonstrates that if the patient has pretty high level of ADA, LDH, it correlates with lower levels of overall survival. Whereas uh, in case of normal LDH levels, median of overall survival is not reached yet. Depending on the response to treatment, today it has already been mentioned, the objective response has not been reached. I mean, the median median of objective res response has not been reached and median overall survival in objective response with stabilization and objective response. But with progression of the disease, it reached seven months. The same story about uh, survival, overall survival, depending on genital status. This is a cock at the baseline level. You see this correlation. So those patients who are more or less preserved, satisfactory, they live longer with this treatment. And uh, more severe patients demonstrate shorter overall survival, which correlates with lower figures. And today, uh, we already uh, saw this particular slide, and Professor Demidov already showed it. So this is our joint project. So we calculated our patient's overall survival depending on immune-mediated adverse events. So those patients uh, who did not have adverse events, uh, so their overall survival was a bit longer than one year. And those who had immune-mediated AEs, those who had these adverse events, uh, median was not reached. Already I mentioned that we took blood tests on the immunological status uh, to detect it, and we already told you that we tried to make particular analysis. Uh, we analyzed population changes on lymphocytes. What is interesting here, as you may see, uh, well, I have to say that we took blood tests uh, before treatment, during the treatment, and then at the end of treatment, after treatment. And uh, we had a, a whole group of doctors under the lead of Irina Baltuyeva who are making these tests. Of course, this is far from being finalized, and we will continue processing this data. But at least I can confirm that uh, by the time, by the beginning of treatment, uh, baseline base level subpopulation analysis was within the range, reference range, and such uh, levels like T helpers, T lymphocytes. You can see and uh, check there was particular trend to increase um, uh, during the treatment, which can mean a particular prognostic favorable scenario. Oh, the same could be said that uh, subpopulation analysis also demonstrated the presence of such uh, cells like CD8, uh, CD38, CD62L. Uh, there is also a trend to increase, uh, which can mean that ipilimumab influenced immunity and caused immune response. But at the same time, uh, there are uh, some other parameters uh, like uh, other lymphocytes which is not quite favorable. So this analysis should be continued. Speaking about regulatory lymphocytes, uh, uh, so here we have very diverse dynamics. And I'm sure our lab will have some work to do. And I'm sure there will be some posters and some publications after all. So we are speaking uh, quite a lot about epilimumab. Uh, this is pretty novel agent, totally different agent with new mode of action and uh, rather effective drug. But on the other hand, it demonstrates particular safety profile. Toxicity profile has already been mentioned today in previous presentations. And as you can see here, mainly this is skin toxicity, diarrhea, colitis, endocrine hepatitis. On the one hand, the percentage is not high, but nevertheless, if you already faced such patient and you treated severe complications and this patient is immune mediated so probably you can remember 
uh, how difficult it could be, and uh, there is particular specificity of providing care to such patients. In our uh, treatment, two patients die, uh, one from thromboembolia, and there was one more patient with renal insufficiency. Uh, he was hospitalized not in our institution, but in the other hospital, because he lived in the other city, and it was not adequate help. Doctors refused to use high doses of steroids, and it led to f fatal outcome. And once again, I would like to show you this slide, because we love uh, very much safety of treatment, and mainly it depends on the doctor. It is in doctor's hands. When we just started working with ipilimumab, uh, so very frequently we hospitalize our patients with AEs, but when we gained particular experience, of course, the hospitalization rate was dramatically reduced. And uh, what are SAEs, serious adverse events, we faced in our practice, in our patients? Rash, you see this particular AEs, two patients shown here, so skin rash, which is rather prevalent, combined in one patient with diarrhea, which required hospitalizations and steroids. And one female patient, I would like to draw attention to this case, because uh, we used um, immunodepressants in Fliximab. So this is patient, a young patient, a female patient, age 26, he operated in April 2014, uh, melanoma of left temporal area, uh, PTA1 and 0M0, September 2015 progression, metastasis in lungs, uh, in the buttocks, relapse uh, uh, on the left side uh, behind the ear, mutation BRAF 600 uh, year, we started EP and then diarrhea grade 3 discovered. Overall diarrhea was uh, resolved with prednisone in the standard dose 1 milligram per kilo, so we continued anti-CTLA-4, so all that happened before the new year, so we kept prednisone, she stick to the diet, but still January 5, during our new year holidays, she has some epigastrical pain, diarrhea more than 10 times a day, asthenia. So usually patients refer to hospitals very late, so we saw her only January 12th, already very severe, pale, with hypotonia, with fever, uh, running temperature up to 38 centigrade, uh, with very painful abdomen in the epigastrium. But the most surprising, it was the regression of all the tumors. They reduced in the diameter from 4 centimeter to 1 centimeter. Of course, the patient was hospitalized. We started infusion therapy prednisone, antibacterial therapy, ciproploxacin, vancomycin, sulfasalazine, and as a patient uh, had high temperature, we administered particular anti-inflammatory treatment, and anti antibacterial. Uh, C-reactive uh, proline was 54, so that was pretty serious period. Uh, let's say when there was high temperature running on the one hand, so presence of infection, but on the other hand, we understand that this is immunomediated phenomenon that could lead to particular severe consequences. So we were selected the tactics uh, and so we performed endoscopy, colonoscopy, and you see here very uh, uh, pronounced terminal ileitis and it was uh, particular ulceration, so high risk of perforation. And uh, with a particular treatment, we introduced infliximab, and many thanks to BMS, because they react pretty fast. So during the uh, one 24 hours, we could manage to get the drug. So I would like to remind you that she was uh, hospitalized January 12th, and one week later, we already introduced infliximab. In, in case, actually, it, was, it could be introduced in three, five days if there is no effect. But I re repeat again, uh, very high running temperature and uh, the risk of septic shock. Uh, this was suspicion to sepsis, so immunodepressants could not, could not be introduced, so we waited. We waited for some time. She received just antibacterial anti-inflammatory treatment. We followed her up, and we were thinking whether to introduce or not. Then infliximab was done, 5 milligrams per kilo, so uh, all, everything was resolved very fast. So two days later, we already reduction of prednisone, and in the controlling examination, you see everything was resolved. So finally, patient currently is alive, feels okay, but unfortunately, yes, it was quite progression of the process, and at the moment she gets next line of treatment uh, in the clinical trial. So we can say 
summing up uh, this story, that epilimumab map in real clinical practice, uh, our results uh, is not worse than in the previous clinical trials, global ones, and the effects are implemented using complex approach, uh, influencing T cell lines, safety profile very well known now. And of course, the doctor who starts treatment should be aware about the data, about the complications and adverse events, and provide adequate uh, measures. And last but not least, it's a search of all possible clinical and laboratory markers of the effectiveness of treatment because it will allow us to identify responders and to select patients uh, better uh, who could get potentially bigger benefit from the drug. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Svetlana. So we have five minutes left. Uh, Lex, will you come over and uh, be prepared for the questions? Yes, I see all of you, all of you, especially if you sit closer, it would be even better. Yes, I, I mean you, yes, please, uh, please take the mic and ask your question. He speaks English. Uh, on a couple of questions. Uh, no, actually, uh, you talked about nivolumab, ipilimumab, uh, this uh, antibody-based uh, uh, immunotherapy. Uh, just uh, you, in this case, you add to the patient, inject to the patient like purified antibodies, strides, yeah. And then also in like in immunohematology, uh, there was the de development of uh, T. Uh, genetically uh, modified T lymphocytes. Are they used uh, widely for solid uh, tumors? And uh, are they developed also for uh, uh, leukemia or now these antibodies like replace this genetically uh, engineered T lymphocytes? So the T cell program um, is mainly still a hemato-oncology uh, program uh, with um, very, very interesting uh, results in refractory uh, leukemias, uh, now also entering uh, myelodysplastic uh, syndromes. But uh, uh, the explorations of the T-CAR cell programs with solid tumors is only starting now uh, there is a T car cell program for pancreatic cancer at Hopkins. Uh, there are T car cell programs now for ovarian cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering. We will be launching our T car cell program next year. Uh, but for solid tumors, it's still only exploratory phase one studies. Is it like uh, so widely used, like uh, nivolumab for? Uh, or uh, ipilimumab uh, for well, the, the solid tumors? The, the T car cell programs are uh, quite demanding on cellular laboratory infrastructure, uh, meaning uh, that um, uh, it's now being installed in many large academic centers as development programs in hemato-oncology, mm -hmm. but it's not yet available for general oncology practice outside some selected uh, uh, academic centers. Oh, I see. And it will take time. And just uh, this uh, question about uh, triple negative breast cancer, uh, is yeah. it like this uh, drugs anti-PD-1, PD-1L1 and uh, CTL4, yeah. are they uh, used actively as like a uh, detection of BRC1 mutations and uh, so platinum drugs? And yeah, so... so uh, the, the field in triple negative breast cancer is very, very new. There has been only one publication until now. It was in the Journal of uh, Clinical Oncology of last uh, month or six weeks ago. And the, the number of triple negative breast cancers that do express PDL1 is only around 20% uh, of all triple negative breast cancers. The trial was done only in those patients who did express PDL1, and in those patients there was a 37% response rate. But it's only a small part of the total population of triple negative breast cancer, meaning that right now there is no data yet on BRCA1, 2, and things like that. 
because the number of patients treated is far too small. But you can find it in the Journal of Clinical Oncology of about six weeks ago, I think. Alexander, if the patient have, haven't have a BRAF muta mutation and have a low level uh, of PDL, what's opinion? What's your opinion about treatment in this patient? Metastatic melanoma. So the, the data on breast cancer are too small to make a statement about PDL1 expression. Uh, in, in general, about PDL1 expression, one can say that um, especially for lung cancer and head and neck cancer, et cetera, there is a fairly clear um, uh, picture that if you have um, uh, more than 5% uh, or 10% of the cells that express PDL1, you are at a fairly good likelihood to be a responder. Then that likelihood is going to be superior to 30, 35%. Uh, for melanoma, it's a bit different. It, PDL1 expression does correlate with response, but does not necessarily correlate with overall survival. And we think that in melanoma you have a very fluctuating PDL1 expression over time. And, and um, uh, I know quite a few cases where we took a second biopsy in a melanoma patient and where a later biopsy was PDL1 positive, whereas an initial one was PDL1 negative. We also know that PDL1 expression in renal cell cancer and in bladder cancer has no predictive impact at all. So the PDL1 story is not going to be a black and white uh, predictive factor story at all. It's, it's just gray or darker gray or lighter gray. Uh, but I think that the MSI screening tool for tumors that are outside the range of very high mutational load. So, uh, um, we know that we see very little responsiveness in prostate cancers and ER positive breast cancers and things like that. But we know that there are a few patients in there who are MSI and that we probably will develop a screening tool uh, for likelihood to, uh, to respond to immunotherapy. Yeah. Um, and uh, what, uh, what are your opinion about chemotherapy by the, uh, for the uh, patient with metastatic melanoma? Well, right now we don't have any effective chemotherapy for melanoma. So, yeah. my 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 opinion is is that uh, unless we find a chemotherapeutic agent that leads to immunogenic cell death and could be given prior to immunotherapy, you may have a sequential regimen philosophy to make use of it. But right now. Um, Right now, I mean, in the countries where not just anti-CTLA-4 is approved, but also anti-PD-1 is approved, right now we start basically all metastatic melanoma patients on anti-PD-1, regardless of having a, a BRF mutation, yes, no. Only the patients, and this is about 10%, 15% at the most, who have a BRAF mutation and who have very bulky disease that is very rapidly progressive, we start them on a BRAF MAC inhibitor. <clears throat> we give it only for six to eight weeks. You will have a response and you immediately come in with your immunotherapy. So by, by and large right now, our treatment approach is to guarantee immunotherapy for all patients. And only if they would progress later and and they would have a BRF mutation, then give the combo, yeah. 